Our scripture reading today is Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor, and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. So I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but there's a little virus going around called COVID-19. Uh, it's in the coronavirus family, so you might have heard it referred to simply as the coronavirus. Uh, the first cases were reported in the Wuhan province in China. Uh, so at first, everyone called it the Wuhan coronavirus, but quickly became politically incorrect to uh, make any reference to China when identifying the virus. So now it's COVID-19. I guess no one cares if 19-year-olds are offended by having their ages associated with the virus. Anyway, this virus can be deadly, so it does need to be taken seriously. It is wise to take precautions. Uh, we don't need to buy up an entire aisle of toilet paper or hand sanitizer, but we do need to use common sense. Now, one common sense precaution that is being strongly encouraged is that we wash our hands with soap and water. This may be surprising to some people, but the idea of washing with water to get clean isn't some new scientific breakthrough on the cutting edge of technology. Uh, the idea has been around for thousands of years. Now, the word wash first appears in Genesis 18.4 when Abraham is visited by three mysterious men who turn out to be messengers from God. Abraham says, Please get a little water. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. I'm not a scientist or a doctor, but I've seen Katie's feet after she's played outside with her sandals on, and I've seen how dirty they can get, and I've seen how that dirt can easily be transferred from the bottoms of her feet to the walls of the house <laughs> as she attempts to, to climb the walls. And I've also seen the amazing transformation that takes place when her feet are washed in water. So I can testify that washing feet in water does remove dirt from the surface of the skin. Water is an amazing substance, and I'm very thankful that God created it for many reasons. But today we'll be focusing on the cleansing properties, because in our passage today we are introduced to the concept of water baptism. And it's in the context of Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist that we find our next quote from Jesus as we attempt to keep the red letters of our Bibles in context. As a body of believers gathered together in a Seventh-day Baptist church, I think we're all familiar with the word Baptist and baptism. 
And most of us have probably been baptized and understand what it means and what it represents for us today. I don't know how many of us have really looked at where the idea to be baptized originated and what led Jesus to ask to be baptized. So these are some of the things we're going to look at today. First thing that we're going to do is establish some context for our passage. And we're going to start with when this event takes place. Verse 1 of our passage says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. That's not very specific, but Luke 3 verses 1 and 2 tells us exactly when it was. It says it was in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituria in the region of Trachonitis, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, while and, uh, Ananias <coughs> and Caiaphas were high priests. And the word came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now, a quick search on the internet shows that Tiberius Caesar reigned from 14 AD to 37 AD. So the 15th year of his reign would have been about 28 AD. Now we can also go to Luke 3.23 and see that Jesus began his ministry at about 30 years of age. So these two sources put the event in about the same time frame. Even though 1 AD is supposed to be the first year after the birth of Christ, it is generally agreed by people with titles before and after their names that Jesus was actually born in about 2 BC or maybe 3 BC. So now we know the timing, but that's about all that we know. The Bible is silent on most of the first 30 years of Jesus' life. The most recent information we have is the incident that we read about last week when Jesus was 12 years old. However, we do have another clue about what is going on, and that is the quote from Isaiah. All four Gospels contain this quote, so it must be important. It is Isaiah 40, verse 3. Luke also contains verses 4 and 5, But to get a little bit more of the context, we'll read Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 5. It says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her, that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A couple of weeks ago, we had a quote from Isaiah as we were finishing up the book of Acts, and we talked about how Isaiah was prophesying to Judah prior to them being taken into captivity for 70 years, and how The book of Isaiah is a combination of exhortations and warnings mixed with predictions of better days and the coming of the Messiah. These five verses at the beginning of chapter 40 are a clear reference to the coming of the Messiah. We know this without question because all four Gospels clearly state that John the Baptist's ministry of preparing the way for Jesus is exactly what Isaiah was talking about. In Matthew 3, 3, the quote is preceded by, For this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. Mark 1, 2 says, As it is written in the prophets, and then it has the quote, and then the quote is immediately followed in verse 4 with, John came baptizing in the wilderness. Uh, Luke 3, verses 3 and 4 says, And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, and then it has the quote, and in John 1, 19 through 23, when John the Baptist is being questioned about his identity, he quotes the Isaiah passage when he says in verse 23, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. There's no doubt that John the Baptist is fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy But what does Isaiah's prophecy have to do with baptism? How does John baptizing people for the remission of sins prepare the way for the Messiah? And where in scripture does the concept even come from? It's not a new concept because no one is asking John 
what baptism is. They're just going out and doing it. The closest thing to baptism that you can find in the Old Testament is the idea of a mikvah. In Hebrew, mikvah simply means a collection or gathering of water. For example, in Genesis 1.10 when it says, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. The word translated gathering is mikvah. There are other Hebrew words that mean water, wash, or bathe. But in Judaism, the word mikvah came to be the word that was used in reference to ceremonial cleansing. The term ceremonial cleansing doesn't appear in scripture, but what it refers to is the process required for an unclean person to become clean. There are many different ways that a person can become unclean, and it is important to know that it is not a sin for a person to become unclean. For example, women who have given birth or who are experiencing their time of the month are unclean. Anyone who has touched a dead body is unclean. Those aren't sins. It just means that God provided instructions for how to become clean. An example of mikvah being used in relation to the ideas of clean and unclean is found in Leviticus 11.36, which says, Nevertheless, a spring or a cistern in which there is plenty of water shall be clean, but whatever touches any such carcass becomes unclean. In this passage is the word plenty that is translated from mikvah. As an American speaking English thousands of years later, I can't explain to you why they chose mikvah as the word to associate with the process of becoming ceremonially clean, but that's what they did. The rabbis over the years have added quite a bit to the process, uh, but there are many places today where people can still go to get a mikvah. Uh, the closest place that I know of is over on Granada in Ormond. So how do we get from a bath that enables you to become ceremonially clean to baptism for the remission of sins and preparing the way for the Messiah? Let's take another look at Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2. It says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her, that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. What stands out to me as I'm reading this is, Her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That sounds a lot like the remission of sins, but where's the connection to mikvah or baptism? Let's keep going and read verses 3 and 4. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. <clears throat> what stands out to me this time is the word straight. It appears once in verse 3 and once in verse 4, but they are slightly different words in the Hebrew. In verse 3, it is the root word, yashar, and in verse 4, it is mishor, which comes from the root word, yashar. So they have very similar meanings of being straight, level, even, or upright. But mishor, the word in verse 4, also has to do with equity and justice. So taking all these things into consideration, it sounds to me like the person who is preparing the way for the Messiah is making a level playing field for the people that the Messiah is coming to save. And in doing so, I see, a connect, I see a connection to mikvah and baptism. Now, the reason that being ceremonially unclean is a big deal uh, was because it meant that you couldn't go to the temple. And if you couldn't go to the temple, then you couldn't bring your sacrifices for the remission of sins. John's baptism didn't take away anyone's sins, but it made them eligible to have their sins taken away. By repenting and confessing their sins, they were demonstrating faith that a Messiah was coming, and they were preparing themselves to become the bride of Christ. They were becoming ceremonially clean so that they would be ready to meet their Messiah and accept his gift of salvation. Let's read some more of the passage in John 1 that I referenced earlier. And here's what it says in verses 21 through, I mean, 25 through 27. <clears throat> and they asked him, saying, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. 
It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. The question that John was asked is an important question for us to consider. Why did he baptize if he was not the Messiah? And also looking at it as believers today from the other side of the resurrection, why did he baptize when the death, burial, and resurrection hadn't happened yet? The answer they gave is that he only baptized people with water. It was a different baptism. There was no Holy Spirit and there was no fire. Those would come later with the Messiah. John's baptism accomplished the same thing as a mikvah. It prepared people to receive the forgiveness of sins that would come with the Messiah, but it didn't give them forgiveness of sins. And John made this gift available to everyone who came to be baptized. Now that we have a little bit of context, we can get back to our passage in Matthew 3 and get a little more context for our quote. Verses 5 and 6 say that all Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan. However, when the Pharisees and Sadducees show up in verse 7, he has a special, special message for them. First of all, he calls them a brood of vipers and asks them who warned them to flee from the wrath to come. And then he talks about their need for repentance. He warns them that it's not enough to be physically descended from Abraham. Their genealogy is not going to save them. They will be known by their fruit. He says that every tree does not, that does not bear good fruit is going to be chopped down and thrown into the fire when the Messiah comes. And also the Messiah is going to clean out his threshing floor. The wheat will be gathered into his barn and the chaff will be burned up with unquenchable fire. In reality, John is giving them the same message that he is giving everyone else, which is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He just seems to be a little bit harsher with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Maybe he was harsher with them because they of all people should have known that the Messiah was coming and that they needed to repent. Whatever the reason is, we now come to the point in our passage where Jesus comes to John to be baptized. And John seems to be wondering the same thing that we're all wondering, which is why. Verse 14 says, And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? Jesus' response to this question is the second quote from Jesus that we have in Scripture. Verse 15 says, But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. The reason that Jesus gives is that by John baptizing him, all righteousness will be fulfilled. But what does that mean? The New Living Translation is about the only translation that says something different. It says, it must be done because we must do everything that is right. But that still doesn't explain it to me. Why is it right? Why does it fulfill righteousness? I think that the key to understanding this quote is understanding what Jesus means when he says fulfill. The Greek word is pleiralo, which means to make replete, to literally cram a net, to furnish, satisfy, execute an office, finish a period or task, or verify or coincide with a prediction. And the King James is also translated as accomplish, complete, end, expire, fill, full, fully preach, perfect, and supply. Remember this word because we'll be talking about it again when we get to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 17. <clears throat> but for now, in the context of Matthew 3, 15, I don't think that righteousness is being accomplished, completed, ended, expired, or filled. And I don't think this be, is being made full or perfect. So that leaves two other options besides fulfill, fully preached and supply. So let's plug those in and see how it reads. For thus it is fitting for us to fully preach all righteousness. Or for thus it is fitting for us to supply all righteousness. I think that either one of those would make sense. The most common explanation that I've heard over the years for why Jesus was baptized was that he did it as an example for us. He obviously didn't need cleansing or remission of sins. So he was just showing us what we need to do. He was leading by example. And in doing so, he was fully explaining or fully preaching what we should do. 
It would also make sense to say that he was supplying our righteousness uh, by being baptized. In previous sermons, I've talked about how none of us is righteous apart from the righteousness that is imputed to us through faith in Jesus. Jesus supplied our righteousness by living a sinless life, which means that he did everything that is right. We know that it was right for him to be baptized because of what happened next. Verses 16 and 17 say, When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You can't get any better confirmation than that. I think we're all hoping for our own well done, thou good and faithful servant moment when we reach the end of this life. Although I am hoping to hear those words, I realize that there's nothing that I can do to earn that compliment. The extent to which I am a good and faithful servant will be the, measured by the extent to which I gave up control of my life and allowed the Holy Spirit to work through me. We began our study today by taking a close look at how John the Baptist fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy by preparing the way for the Messiah. But one thing that we didn't talk about was how John came to fill that role. Luke describes the events surrounding John's birth in Luke 1, 5 through 80. And as much as I would like to, I'm not going to read all 76 verses. <coughs> but I am going to share a couple of small passages because it relates to how all righteousness came to be fulfilled. In Luke 1, 15 through 17, an angel says to John's father about John, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And then after his birth and circumcision, his father is filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesies, saying in verses 76 through 79, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of, in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And then verse 80 says, So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. So what I want us to see is that the reason that John the Baptist was an extraordinary man was that God selected him for a specific purpose and then equipped him to carry out that purpose. We saw in the passage how he was filled with the Holy Spirit from the time that he was in his mother's womb. Uh, so part of that purpose was baptizing Jesus so that all righteousness would be fulfilled. But John would have never have gotten to that point without submitting to God and allowing the Holy Spirit to work through him. Even though God chose him from birth to fulfill this purpose, I, I do believe that John had the choice of whether or not he was going to submit to God and fulfill that purpose. God has chosen each of us to play a specific role in his master plan. Our roles may not be glamorous or fulfill a prophecy in Isaiah, but our roles are important, and we can't carry them out in our own strength. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us and empower us. Jesus pleased his Father because he was completely submitted to his Father, and he allowed the Holy Spirit to work through him. So let us follow his example. Let us completely submit ourselves to the Father and allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for <coughs> the life uh, that Jesus lived, the sinless life that he lived. Uh, we uh, thank you for the many examples in Scripture that we have of him submitting himself to you and carrying out your will. And we thank you for the gift of salvation that was made available to us uh, through his atoning sacrifice. And uh, Father, I pray that we would accept that gift and that we would uh, live our lives 
uh, as, a, as an offering to you, as a way to demonstrate our love for you and our love for others. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.